Hey guys, welcome to GraphQL Radio. Um, I'm your host, Abi Iyer, with my co-host. Hey, I'm Johannes Schickling from GraphQL, and yeah, welcome. Nice. Um, if you guys don't know, uh, GraphQL Radio is a monthly podcast about all things GraphQL. Um, and uh, today, we are excited to have our first guest, Danielle Mann, from Apollo. Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, Danielle, to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thanks uh, for being here. We invited you here because obviously Apollo is a big part of the GraphQL community, um, especially all the tools that you specifically are building. And that talk you gave at uh, GraphQL Summit, mm -hmm. we want to get you on the show to give some knowledge to all the people that are going to watch this. I think most of our people know what Apollo is, but if, you know, for the newbies, could you explain what Apollo is? Sure. Um, so Apollo is kind of the brand that encompasses a whole bunch of GraphQL developer tools. Um, their developer tools range from everything for making clients, or it's, we have clients that help you build web apps and iOS apps. Um, these clients do things like caching and pagination and like really important logic that all your apps need to have um, that you might not necessarily want to write yourself. Uh, other tools that Apollo has, we have a whole bunch of just like GraphQL, um, open source like boilerplate tools, tutorials, uh, server tools, and then we also have um, dev tools and commercial products. So I primarily at Apollo work on our commercial product optics, which is a performance monitoring tool for your GraphQL servers. Um, and another Apollo project I've done is uh, making Chrome DevTools. So while you're yeah. doing with right. Apollo that, client, you can use like GraphQL DevTools. Right. So how did you go about the, the DevTools in general? So I think you just, did it just come up like as a site hack project and then you decided to, to put it up? Or yeah. How did you... I'm excited you asked. Um, kind <laughs> of how that came about is we started using Apollo Client primarily ourselves as we were building optics. And so we got a bunch of um, our own sort of like dog fooding feedback in and we realized that there's all this stuff that exists in Apollo Client that's really cool that um, is kind of hidden or complicated. And so as you're developing with Apollo Client and you want to like live in the abstract kind of layer of I'm using Apollo Client, I don't want to think about how it's handling state with Redux and stuff. Um, we wanted it to be really easy, but we realized that um, it wasn't necessarily easy because you would start needing to debug things and then you'd have to go into the Redux dev tools and dive into these things that we were trying to extract, abstract away from you anyways. So kind of over lunch conversations, um, we started throwing around the idea of dev tools of like, what if we made something like Redux dev tools or React dev tools, but for Apollo where you could do everything you, or you, could, you could figure out everything you need to know about the state of Apollo Client um, just there. And so we had a company hack week around, I think it was mid-December, and I worked with mm, Sashko okay. and David Glasser to make dev tools, um, and it was really cool. It was kind of three people who had come at using Apollo Client from three very different perspectives coming together um, to make these tools. And yeah, we produced them through a hack week at the company and released them, but we've been um, like very slowly adding more features, uh, merging pull requests, fixing bugs and stuff since then. Right, right, that, that's super cool. So how is the adoption going of, of this tool in general? Of the dev tools? Yeah. It, it's going really well. Um, yeah. We've got, a bunch of like five star ratings on the Chrome Web Store. I think the Chrome Web Store says we've got like 3,500 active users or something. That's crazy. Um, yeah, That's and then That's another crazy. really cool thing. Just came out. Yeah, yeah. It's been, like a few months. Um, and another cool thing that we get from having the dev tools is we can like get more understanding of usage of Apollo Client and stuff. Like yeah. using what version, because we kind of are trying to really encourage anyone who's using Apollo Client to definitely also use the DevTools. Right. So how deeply are, is, is the, are the DevTools integrated with the Apollo Client? So um, the, the specific features around Apollo Client, so something about uh, query watching and, and so on. Yeah. So how deeply is that, is that integrated? Well, currently there's three things that the DevTools show you or do for you. One is we show you which queries you're watching. 
Um, so any queries that your page is actively making, polling has made, anything where your page has made a query and gotten data that's in the cache, we show that query. And then for the query, we show what the string was, um, what the variables were, and then we have a running graphical button where you can click it and it will automatically like, there's a graphical panel that's a second feature. It'll like hop over to the graphical panel, paste all the data in for you, and then fetch it. Mm, that's um, awesome. Yeah, and then the third feature is store inspection. Um, oh. And that was the feature I was actually most excited about building, yet I've actually used it the least. Um, but what that does is, um, since your GraphQL store is a graph where objects have references to different objects, that one allows you to investigate what's actually in your cache and then like follow these paths. Because um, we use Redux under the hood in Apollo Client, so you can use the Redux step tools to investigate the state of your cache, but it doesn't have all of these references. Um, we also have a search ability in our dev tools that Redux doesn't have. Right, really right. Yeah. Designed for a public client. So, Bill, one thing I have to say about uh, the dev tools is before having an app that was just Redux, that worked popular, just a Redux app using um, Redux as just the data layer for the mm -hmm. client, right? Um, and uh, we, we were using the Redux logger, Redux dev tools, and then once we switched into Apollo, we didn't have any dev tools that would really help us. We were just like, we were actually looking at the logger and we were like going down like, oh, okay, this is actually a reference. Like, we didn't actually know the state of the Apollo client until we got to see it. And then once the dev tools came out, you can actually see the state of whatever queries you've made the, like yeah. the different types of queries, the mutations you made, also with the order of what, what's going on, what and, it yeah. really, and it really helps you debug everything. You know, like if, if anybody has not downloaded this yet, it really, <laughs> really, really good, like for sure. Um, one thing I really enjoy about uh, the dev tools is the actual built in graphical right there. You know, um, mm -hmm. as someone who lives in the browser, right, it's, it's nice to just. You know, I'm in DevTools all day anyway. Why can't I just do some queries right there to test some things out, you know? Uh, that's great, so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so speaking of Redux, um, so I've been following the, basically the whole Apollo journey from the early, early days. So I kind of like when Sashko first created the Apollo repository and just when it was basically just the idea about Apollo, but no implementation yet. And they're in the first, um, GitHub threads came up and uh, it was basically a big discussion. Should we base it on, on Redux or not? And what should the API be like? Um, what people didn't really like about Relay should have been done differently and so on. So now kind of like a bit more than a year later, I, I guess, um, was um, basing the whole thing on Redux, was that the, the right decision? Or what kind of, what kind of roadblocks did you hit where where should it be a bit different or so how, what is the, the story around that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't actually myself worked too much on Apollo client, so I might not be the best person for the question, but from my perspective, um, one of the big driving forces of using Redux was the fact that you got the Redux dev tools and that you could see the state of your Apollo client cache and the way it was um, like dispatching actions and stuff. Um, through the Redux dev tools. And so in one of the early versions of the Apollo client docs and stuff, there was a section, I think it's probably still there, on like how to act, actually use the Redux dev tools to your advantage, like with Apollo client. So I know that was um, one of the big driving forces is the whole purpose of building Apollo client was to like yeah. make what, make the best developer experience we could possibly think of for GraphQL and um, having dev tools was definitely part of that. A year ago, I went to the um, Meteor, it was the Meteor Customer Day, right? This is before uh -huh. Apollo, Apollo came out. And they uh -huh. came to us and they were like, hey guys, we're thinking about making this um, GraphQL client called Apollo. We already named it, we got a cool logo. <laughs> and uh, Jeff was telling us about, you know, this is what our next plans for the data layer was. And mm -hmm. I talked to Sashko that day at lunch and he was like, hey, what do you guys think about um, using Redux? Because like, it's the most popular thing right now, and like, we're gonna just do it. And they already had sample code, and like, Jonas is already working on GraphQL tools and the server. Like, this is early, when things were still called Apollo Server. Like, that's the old, 
Those are the oldest. <laughs> it was a year ago. It was a year ago. It was even that long ago. And um, the whole point was, I think personally, that time when we they were still uh, designing in the early phases, when I was contributing in the early phases, it, Redux was blowing up. It was like the most popular state management thing. It was like you know the bee's knees. Now it's like just now it's commonplace, right? People think it's just Redux is Redux. You know, back then it was like holy crap. There's this Redux thing. It's amazing. And I think that's also a kind of an influence, you know. Look at Apollo client issues. Everyone wants, you know, uh, Rx. They want Rx store. They want this store. They want that store. Because other stores are getting more popular now, you know. So that's, the, that's just the evolution, I think. I, I guarantee there will be a, a different state store in six months, for sure. That'll be <laughs> that's Yeah. It. Um, so speaking of stars, what I'm really interested in, what we are, um, we are getting this question constantly at GraphCool. Um, so we have a lot of people coming over from Firebase uh, to, to use uh, like a Graph, uh, GraphQL service instead. And one of the things they're used to is having uh, offline capability. And with mm -hmm. GraphQL, there isn't really a solution for, um, for offline yet. So uh, I had a couple of chats um, with Sashko about that. And the biggest problem seems to really be that um, if you ask 10 people, 10 people will tell you something different what <laughs> offline means for them. So yeah. what, is, what is your take on, on GraphQL and offline? And what, what are your thoughts around this? That's a cool question. Um, I, haven't, I haven't had the need or like, to, I haven't had the need to do that yet. So I don't have too many strong thoughts, but uh, one of the ideas I did have for the dev tools was the ability to kind of take a snapshot of your cache at any point in time and download it. Um, and you could use this for things like bug reports or like feature requests or something. And so when I think about offline development, I think what if I could interact with my app in such a way that I populate my cache with everything I would need to develop offline and then can take a snapshot of that and like, have it get relayed back to me if I'm like on an airplane and wanting to do development. I think it's a great idea. Snapshot testing like that, even with UI now is very popular. I think it's a great mm -hmm. idea. You could also run like a like an agent to to uh, to take that snapshot and verify yeah. it at any given time. You know? like that's okay. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Another thing um, that we have talked about a lot is mocking data. Um, and so that's another solution kind of to development offline with GraphQL is um, since if you have static queries, you know exactly what type of data you need. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of replicate your schema on the client, uh, mock it, and then run that yeah. offline as and, well. And that's, that's fantastic since there are like yeah. so many, just yesterday there was, um, there was this GraphQL faker library or the, the CLI basically released. Um, yeah. Two weeks ago, we released GraphQL up, so it's getting so much easier to really test with your with your GraphQL um, mm -hmm. APIs for front end developers, which is fantastic. So, um, kind of leading to a next question. So, from from a GraphQL perspective, one of our missions was always to make it easier for front end developers to get started with GraphQL, mm -hmm. and we give them a GraphQL server. So. From your perspective, what do you think is um, still way too difficult about, about GraphQL and what, what would you like to see kind of like getting easier over, over time? Getting started? Um, it is difficult to kind of set up the whole package. Um, and so I would definitely like to see tools that help you to do that more and more easily. Like um, one thing we kind of were inspired by this past week was, um, have you guys seen sketch.expo? Yeah. Yep. Where they make it like super, super easy to like create a React Native app. That's something where if we could create that type of experience for GraphQL, um, just to get started, to get people to get their own data in front of them in an app as fast as possible so they can see the value, um, I think that would be huge. For me, like the biggest thing I used as I was learning and getting started was just graphical. Like, yeah, graphical yeah, is so totally awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like once it's set up and you have the ability to explore um, your schema, like I think that is just killer. So exactly, yeah. This is like this like big that. aha moment for for everybody getting started with GraphQL. This was like this is a single thing that sells everybody on, on GraphQL, or at least gets people curious to try it out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
Um, yeah. So that's another thing, like one of the reasons I was excited about putting graphical in the dev tools is because like, say you're a developer who's just jumped into like working on someone else's app um, and you're still kind of learning about GraphQL and Apollo client, like if you have graphical in the dev tools where there's no configuration set up, it just already works for you. Like, I think that's huge as well. Yeah, I think even for beginners, I think when we were um, integrating uh, Apollo clients, um, at Web WebWorkCon, uh, we had such a legacy code base at that time, right? It's like two, two <laughs> old code. Um, and uh, we had that code, and when we were integrating into um, new parts of the UI, uh, the hardest thing was to understand, like, you know, the different pieces. Like, I need to use the GraphQL higher order component, and I'm already about higher order components, so I was down with that. But I was like, okay, then, and then it has different options, so, okay, there's the variables, and, like, like, oh, why can't I just interpolate a string? Like, that was a bad practice. Um, and then we didn't actually, we were actually trying to model our GraphQL schemas based on our server schema, which is a bad idea. Like, these are all the things that beginners do in the beginning, um, especially like when we don't know the best practices. And then there's a GraphQL Summit, which had so much knowledge about everything. I learned so much. You know, I loved your talk about GraphQL first development, and I was wondering if we could talk about GraphQL first development. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like the talk. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. So GraphQL first development is um, kind of a name that we gave this process that we came up with as we were developing optics that we're very excited by. And uh, it's called GraphQL first. Um, but what that really means is like you go into a project or you like you know specifically that you want to use GraphQL to do something and so the step is basically um, it's it's kind of like a philosophy around communication and the communication is all designed around the schema. So um, GraphQL first development is this way of doing development where anytime you want to like make a change um, to your GraphQL layer you start with talking about what the schema looks like. If that means you're building an app, it means you start by defining your schema. If you're building a new feature, it means like you're defining the fields or the types. If you're changing something, it means that you just like talk really clearly about what the schema is because the philosophy is um, if the schema is your contract, then the front and the back end teams can be extremely productive because you come up with the schema contract, you get sign offs from the front and the back end teams, and then the back end team knows exactly what to do. Um, or they, they have like a strict thing to develop to. Um, and the front end team can count on the schema and start writing, you know, like mocking uh, data and stuff and then building components off of it such that when the back end and the front end are actually ready to come together, since you've already decided what the schema is, yeah. they have changed. It's like as simple as flipping a switch. Yeah, I want to talk about um, like my experience and I want to talk about GraphCool. Um, because that also offers a different type of experience um, for this type of development, like this GraphQL first development. Mm -hmm. uh, at WorkCom, GraphQL first actually means schema first because mm -hmm. not all of our clients are on GraphQL yet, right? So what does that mean? It's like, well, we need to have this client-side representation that could be GraphQL, it could be JSON schema, it could be something that can be converted into, you know, Android models or Mantle models for iOS. And, so how we manage this process is we um, we, we built this central repository for types, and we auto-generate different types for different clients, and GraphQL is one of those those types that we generate. Um, and that's helped us do GraphQL first development when everybody involved, all clients, like even because even if you weren't using GraphQL yet, you were still involved because it was your, it was your schema, whether whether it was GraphQL or not. So we brought everyone together and it was like GraphQL first because we were building GraphQL schemas that were just translating into everybody else's crap. And uh, that's what really, that's what I think GraphQL first really is, is like that schema conversation. Because after that, the backend guys, um, and girl, um, they, uh, uh, they just, got, they just got, got cooking, you know? Yeah. And within a couple of days, I already had my API. The great thing is I mocked out the schema. Once, once you have a schema, you can mock it, I already built my UI, so the integration time, like you guys explained in that um, talk and in the blog post, I think, is that integration time is like super small, right? Yeah. Uh, smaller than it would be, you know. And that's and what 
That, there's also a whole new, whole new perspective to that. So we're working with a lot of agencies and companies who are exploring GraphQL and you have a lot of different kind of teams. So for example, agencies work a lot with designers and designers and the way they think about concepts, they are kind of implicitly already talking about data, but they are not really aware of this concept. And designers are not the best people to really think deeply about APIs. But with GraphQL, we've really, with GraphQL types, with this IDL syntax, we really yeah. made the, uh, we really had the experience that um, this is something really approachable for them. So they could actually, now they have a, a mean to communicate between development and project managers and designers where they can really agree on this is the kind of data we are working with. And um, this just helps this, this contract you spoke about. This is just an incredibly powerful tool. So, um, Abi, you, you touched on, on code generation. I think this is an incredibly exciting topic on its own. Yeah. So, um, for, for me personally, code generation is always was a bit scary and yeah, it had like a it bit was, of a right? <laughs> um, negative connotation. But with GraphQL and being all typed and so on, um, I think code generation might get a whole new whole new chance to, to exist. So what are, what are your thoughts around code generation? Uh, I know that Martin is using it, is, is relying heavily on it yeah. for Apollo iOS. Um, mm -hmm. We're using it quite a bit for uh, code generations in TypeScript, for example. So what are, what are your thoughts around this? Uh, I think I might just pass this one back to you because I haven't done too much with code generation. Okay, okay. Um, so my opinion on code generation in the beginning it was like super scary because if you didn't write your own code, you know, it's remember when uh, Babel first came out, people were like, it's not ES5. Like I didn't write it. I, I don't, I didn't write it. I don't know what it looks like. And I had that same feeling in the beginning. Right. But the thing about it, like life as a programmer right now is a life of transformation. Like you, you, you do everything and it like Webpack transform, Meteor transform, uh, Babel transform, Everything transforms everything into something else. Like look at closure script, right? Like things like that. Now, with code generation, schema generation, like a lot of that is a lot of work to write all the time. Like in, before we did code generation for schemas, my Android and iOS developers probably spent like 30 minutes recopying the schema that we all decided on. And now we save, you know, a lot of time overall. I personally like code generation and I think uh, as things get more complex, we're just going to write code to write code. You know? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really interesting idea. And, and I'm looking forward to, to ask the, uh, the same question to, to more people. I think especially Martin, for example, yeah. has a whole new perspective on this. And also um, we, we talked to a bunch of people um, who are, for example, written their own TypeScript compiler to directly work uh, in this case, with uh, with the relay transformation stuff, but there are like a lot of lot of the same concepts um, being brought into into a new light now. So that I, for me personally, that that's super interesting to to kind of observe how how that's how that's evolving. Yeah. So I want to talk about optics for a second. Mm -hmm. um, so optics uh, optics is great. Uh, I love it. I'm glad. And I wanted to know like what were the technical challenges building that UI, because it looks complex, you know? Yeah, building the UI, that's an awesome question. Um, I mean, I don't have too many things to say on, in terms of GraphQL, I think that's a really good thing, like to not necessarily have technical challenges because you use GraphQL. Yeah. Um, the UI, I think the biggest technical challenges were just like getting all of the data into those, into those graphs. Uh, we're making some pretty, large and data heavy GraphQL queries. Um, yeah. so getting that, getting it to be reactive, um, getting the data to populate, you know, cause the graphs are live, they're showing live data. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of stuff to do there. It was just really heavy in data viz. Like so, so, but how did, how did the schema kind of evolve over now that we're talking about GraphQL first development, how uh -huh. did the schema develop from the, the first idea you had for a, uh, for optics mm -hmm. um, versus where optic is now and maybe where you see it's where it is in, in two months? Yeah, well, the original human development process for optics was pretty interesting and 
we ended up sitting in a lot of meetings talking with our front and back end teams like and our wireframes about what type of data we would need what type of shapes it should be in and that's kind of how we ended up coming up with GraphQL first because we decided the schema and then we developed separately for like a month or two, I think, um, and eventually brought it back. And since we launched Optics and have been adding features, it's been pretty easy going. Um, as we added, so we recently shipped the heat map, uh, which is like showing performance data over time. I'm not sure if you guys saw that. But yeah. That required it's cool. a pretty large, yeah, it required a pretty large um, schema addition. Um, of like a new type and a new way to query it and new mutations and stuff. And so the way we developed that is uh, we basically got back in a room just like we did at the beginning, decided what the scheme would be and then, you know, worked separately and brought it together. Yeah, I think Optics, Optics is such a um, data intensive app. It's much like if anybody knows about Kadira, you know, Kadira was type of if you're in the media community, mm -hmm. uh, Kadira is like very similar. Um, mm -hmm. and it, and like, the thing about it is when you're running a huge high performance app or trying to run a performance app that, that performs well, you got people looking at that data all the time. You know, like I get Slack messages at night, you know, page <laughs> faults, you know, things, all the things that are happening. And, uh, you know, the great thing about optics is it's visually appealing. Like, it's, it's not a drag. It's not like going into logly.com and stuff. It's like not a drag, you know. It's like really nice, and it has that it has that MDG style, like that nice clean design. Yeah. The, the, the data is also super valuable, you know. Like um, a lot of people don't know, but like a lot of people are assuming that you know query times are negligible, but they are. And for the for the user, I think that's that's actually very important. You know? mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's a great way to to manage performance. Well, the killer use case for optics is um, you log in, you see that you had one query or a set of queries that took a particularly long time and you don't know why and you go and you look at a trace and you say, oh, it's this resolver and then you go into your code and like figure out what to fix to make it better. Yeah. So, so how proactive are you actually uh, for your customers and to, in helping them to, to optimize their, their queries? And <laughs> how much do we help our own customers? Yes. Um, we don't often look at customer data with them and help them try to optimize we we give them the tools to do it themselves and then ask them like how it went that's the new consulting business you know? <laughs> <laughs> on the side it's like yeah. all the consulting yeah but i mean we ourselves are a customer of optics um like we have optics instrumented with our own our own apps with Gal like primarily uh, galaxy for Meteor. And so um, we've noticed a lot of interesting things in Galaxy's performance just through having optics. Uh, one cool thing I noticed a couple weeks ago was um, I was looking at the, the heat map of performance over time as I was developing it. And I noticed this like very distinct bump at 4 p.m. PST for five minutes. There was just like a distinct shift up and then a distinct shift back down. And I went to the Galaxy team and I was like, do you have any ideas why this might be happening? And they were like, oh, 4 p.m. PST is 12 a.m. UTC, which means our analytics cron job was probably sending data. <laughs> cron job. <man>. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wow, oh, that's so cool. I never would have like noticed. Yeah. Right. It's funny when you see those like over a week, they're like, oh, it's at the exactly. same exact time. Wow. I wonder exactly. why. It's so specific. So what's kind of next for, for Apollo Optics? Are Great there, question. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of cool things that we want to do. Um, I don't want to like make any promises, but things that we have in our minds are um, alerting, error reporting, showing yes, yeah. um, different events as they happen now that we have a view over time. Um, there's a lot of stuff we're excited about. Yeah, you can basically, other people have already written a playbook what's valuable in, in a exactly. development stack. And now you, <laughs> you have the, the, the nice opportunity to apply all of that to GraphQL. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> the great thing is there's like, there's not much to instrument, you know, like there's only a couple of things that you really need to look at, you know, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, uh, I think over time we'll see what, like there'll be new things that people want to look at, but I don't know, we're in the HTTP world and so is GraphQL. It's like, it's the same tooling, which is great. That's, that's the beautiful thing about it. You, know, you can use new relic if you want. Mm -hmm. um, you can build your own optics too. I've, I've done that. I've built my own optics before. 
Um, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't recommend it. You know? <laughs> it's a lot of time, but you know, you can build your own. Uh, yeah. uh, I wanted, I wanted to ask um, about Apollo, and then now we have you know MDG owns Apollo and like the full thing, you know, all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, how do you guys are hiring? By the way, right? You guys are hiring. We are hiring. Yeah. I was wondering, like, how, how do new engineers get onboarded into this world you guys built? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it's kind of, it's not anything that's formal in particular. Uh, when I joined and started doing things with GraphQL, the team was basically like, here are some awesome resources. Go to learngraphql.com and, like, read all of our blog posts from the last, like, six months or whatever, and, and so that's kind of how it worked for me. The last few engineers that we've onboarded um, kind of came knowing a lot of things already because they're in the community. So oh, nice. There was like nice. not too much onboarding for them being like, this is what GraphQL is because they already knew. Yeah. So how, how do you recommend people, like people who maybe stumble upon this, this post and they're just, what is this GraphQL thing? So what do you, or yeah, like a, another friend of yours who's maybe now diving into development, so mm -hmm. what do you recommend to them? How do they get started um, with, with GraphQL? They don't know GraphQL yet, but next week they should build something with GraphQL. What do you recommend to them? Yeah, I think the most important thing is just getting people in front of some sort of graphical as soon as possible for them to test their own schemas or uh, just test how like get familiar with how writing queries and stuff works. So, uh, I mean, I'd probably say like go to learngraphql.com or something similar. Like you guys have amazing tutorials on GraphQL. Yeah. Um, and do that and then get in front of GraphQL um, and like start writing queries as fast as possible. Awesome. Yep. I think that's a good approach. Yeah. Cool. So before we wrap up, um, maybe one question from, from my side. So um, there are a couple of things that I have in mind what I'd like to see to be changed in the future about GraphQL in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to prime you. I, I rather want to hear like <laughs> your, your thoughts on this. So uh, if you could change a thing about GraphQL, what, what would it be? Yeah, I think if I could change a thing about the syntax, I wouldn't want to have um, variable type declarations at the top of queries. Um, I find that very verbose. Yeah, it's so annoying. <laughs> ah. It's like repeated. It is. It's so annoying. You always um, do the same thing twice, like this, and then... Okay. Yeah, you have to do it three times. Yeah, it's like, what the heck? Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> oh, um, and then Sign the petition. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's an RFC now, right? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, make an RFC. <laughs> really. That's true. <laughs> what would you change? Uh, uh, what would you change about the type system? Um, the type system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm pretty happy with it at the moment. I don't have anything there that I would specifically want to change. Oh, you don't wish you had a date type? Come on. A date type? Oh, a date <laughs> type would be nice. We've been getting <laughs> away with just timestamp strings, so like yeah. ISO strings. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> or like, you know, you hide it as a float or something, you know? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, the well, graphical has a date time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, yeah, that's that's a good thing about uh, those managed services. They like, you know, that's the that's one of the pain points I feel in the type system is like dates or like, it'd be nice to you know making scalars. It'd be nice to that was an easier process for me. Yeah. Uh, I wish there was an any type too, just because you need to some if you're integrating incrementally, like like Apollo preaches. Like sometimes you just need a escape hatch. <laughs> any, dude, any. I don't really know right now. I need to yeah. see what's going. You know? Good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, this was a really really great episode. Um, a lot of great knowledge. A lot of good conversations all around. Uh, I just want to thank you for for, for being here. Yeah, um, definitely. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, and uh, everyone watching, thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna get into picks right now. Um, I'm gonna start with my pick. So my pick is all the stuff that's happening in Apollo Android. I am like, I'm an Android advocate here at WorkPop. I don't even use Android though. I just am an advocate for it. Uh, just the, the, team, the Android team. Uh, there's so much work by John Shelley going on in Apollo Android, and I just want to call that out. So if you're an Android developer or a mobile developer, check out you know, Apollo Android.
that's my pick. All right, uh, I'm gonna follow along. Um, so a couple of people might have already seen it, but the guys from uh, API Gurus, um, they're uh, in, based in Eastern Europe, and uh, a couple of weeks ago they've released GraphQL Voyager, and yesterday they've released GraphQL Faker. So they're working on a lot of cool things, also in regards to GraphQL schemas, IDL, and so on. So we're in close collaboration with them, and I highly recommend checking out their, their projects. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, I guess my picks would just go to anyone who is uh, actively making GraphQL tutorials um, and content. Um, I've seen so many great blog posts, like even in the last month with that, and it's amazing. Just getting more people into this community. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Then see you probably next for the next episode. Yeah. Uh, thanks for tuning in to GraphQL Radio. We'll see you later. <laughs>